Grace and peace to all of you, my father's children. Here we are another night in Bible studies here at Better Rafa Christian Center in Windsor, uh, Ontario, Canada. Another great temperature day today. Yesterday was over 90 degrees. Today in the 80s. Uh, we know it won't last, but it's, it's, it's good while it lasted. Um, so may God bless you that are tuning in. Please share the link with someone or let them know that we're uh, now getting to Bible studies. Remind them so they could join us in the studying of God's Word as we're still focusing in on the Church of God in Christ. We are currently in the book of Acts, chapter 21. We're going to start from verse 17 of the, first, of the said chapter, Acts chapter 21, uh, from verse 17. Uh, we were last week in the book of Acts, chapter 20, where we saw the Apostle Paul uh, going uh, forth uh, towards, heading towards Jerusalem with a lot of um, uh, challenges. And now we're going to see him um, enter into Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, etc. So we are going to see what's going to transpire today. Again, we're focusing on the Church of God in Christ. So uh, in the case of where, how does a leader operate under pressure? What does a leader do when other people are within the body, is opposing to certain action that he's doing. So all of that we're going to focus on tonight because it's important to know we can't write the rules over. It's already written. And I keep saying that with respect to the Church of God in Christ because there's nothing new under the sun currently. And uh, you may show me technology and all those things. Uh, that's literally irrelevant. The ways of man, there's nothing new he could come up with. Uh, he could improve on what already exists, perhaps, but uh, nothing new. So the leader of the church, the Apostle Paul, in the particular church of the Gentile wing, the Gentile wing of the church, uh, a dedicated, committed leader, and we are looking at his life in this particular past couple of uh, lessons, how he functioned in the body of Christ, and how the body of Christ responded to him. We saw initially when he got into the body of Christ, how they shunned him, rightfully so, from a, a human perspective. They were so terrified of the man because he had a lot of baggage prior to coming into the body of Christ. And it's not easy for people to shake off what they know about you. Nevertheless, over time, he proved himself to be uh, faithful and even more faithful than some who was there for, before him. Now, in Acts chapter 21, we see now this leader who said goodbye to the folks at Ephesus, all the leaders at Ephesus, or last lesson. He said goodbye to them with tears, etc., warn them about uh, bad leaders who come up uh, from other areas and from among them. And now we see him now said he's destined to go to Jerusalem in spite of some uh, hiccups along the way, even warning uh, people's emotions get involved along with the Holy Spirit. He said, look, you don't want to go to Jerusalem. Uh, one, of this, one of the prophets said, look, they're going to tie your hands and feet in, in a symbolic way. Basically, you're going to be arrested, tried, you're going to be in trouble. And Paul said, look, y'all, stop crying for me, please, because you're breaking my heart here. So it's not that Paul is stubborn. He's destined to do what God called him to do in spite of the warning um, that sets around him. Now, let's look at Paul uh, here in the 17th verse of Acts chapter 21. Again, I'm looking at the leader of the Church of God in Christ, one of the leaders of the Church of God in Christ, and how we can pattern our life as leaders and potential leaders when it comes to the body of Christ, how we function. We're going to see that sometimes the body of Christ in leadership position will make decisions that's not always going to be uh, proved to be uh, fruitful. Nevertheless, those decisions are made uh, with good intentions. And we, let's go right into it now in verse 17 of Acts chapter 21. So, and when we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. So, a, a joyous occasion. It was received with joy. And um, there was, well, some people say, oh, I thought something was going bad going to happen. Look, everything is all unky dory. But first initial doesn't mean everything going to be the same way. So, it was received with great joy and gladness. And it was a great celebration Initially, however, the day following, just one day after, um, Paul went in with us unto James. James, at this point, 
the Lord's brother, is uh, quite uh, certainly is the, the top leader of the Jerusalem uh, council, or church, if you will. And so that's why his name is here mentioned. You could also recall Peter did leave town at a certain time due to a uh, price that was on his head. And um, James, the brother of the Lord, um, another James was killed, which is John's brother. But James, the brother of the Lord, he wasn't killed as yet. So all the elders were, were present. I mean, every, all the church leaders in Jerusalem was present because they were, according to the first judgment that was ruled against them, leave them alone. If this thing is of God, you can't stop it. If it's not of God, it's going to be destroyed. So let's leave them alone. So we could see that the leaders now were not necessarily stopped from being harassed. They just they were not running for their lives because they, 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 the judgment, if you will, is just let them be. Just they're telling people to stop and just don't believe in these guys anymore. So James here appears to be the leader of the church at this time. All the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, greet them, if you will, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. So Paul here went before the church leaders and gave his testimony. Remember, they didn't send Paul to minister. God did. And it wasn't, um, I, had a, I just woke up and feel that God is calling me. No, he was dramatically called. So there is no dispute with respect to God sent out the 12 apostles, uh, 11, if you will, and then um, they choose one more. But Paul was also sent out. That's clear, right? Based upon scriptural references and all that, he was sent out too. Not like I have an idea, I have a feeling that God is calling me. This is completely different, and it could not be more crystal clear in the scripture. So God sent him out. So it was not Peter sent him out or James or the apostles. He was like them sent out. Only in particular, he was sent to the Gentiles. Uh, though Peter opened the door first, then he was sent. So he gave his testimony of what God wrought through the ministry of which he was leading with his entourage. So they weren't there. He's giving his testimony. I think it's important if you have a testimony, share it. Amen? Would it be with church leader, with your friends, your neighbors, and loved one associate? Share it. Literally, that's how the goodness of God is shared. If God is blessing me like you know about his business and I keep it to all myself, no one else got a clue. So it's always a good thing to share the good uh, news. So Paul gave his testimony after greeting the elders and let them know what God is doing uh, in the ministry in which he has gave to him uh, among the Gentiles. So he did that. Now, of course, they already heard what was going on, right? Because word travel among believers and others. So they knew what Paul was doing uh, in the various places that he was preaching. Uh, James, <clears throat> uh, Peter even mentioned some of the things that Paul uh, made mention of. So we know they are aware of his teaching. They may not, however, agree with everything that he's teaching, particularly the Mosaic law and how Paul defines it. And this is the occasion where uh, we have some isms and schism within the body of Christ because the deeper revelation that one has over another will cause a uh, uh, schism, right? It, I mean, God called Paul in which, in which he did upset the entire church. Amen? So God no, doesn't need permission from the church <laughs> to, to send someone to call and send you. He doesn't need a permission. He's going to do it in spite of your feelings or your emotions. This is absolutely true. God doesn't need the church permission to bring people into church, whether the church like them or not. It's biblically proven he done it in spite of the church's objections. Paul being a classic example. Amen? And if you know that um, those key leaders in the church, God let them know, he speak to them sometime, this is my doing, so, you know, run with it, go with it, eat it up, suck it up, if you will. 
the larger body now, they just got to learn over time to trust what God is doing. In verse 20, it says here that when they heard, again, the testimony of the Apostle Paul, they glorified the Lord. They glorified the Lord after hearing the, the great ministry that was launched under his leadership throughout the region and beyond. So they magnified God and said unto him, Thou seest brother, so here they identify him as a brother. No one in the Bible I notice in the New Testament is hung up on titles, except for in our days and perhaps in our previous days before ours. Some folks are quite upset if you don't call him by the title. And that is a shame, unfortunately, that is a shame. Brother, you see how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, because Paul is giving his testimony, so James and the others say, look, you see, there's thousands of Jews who believe. But certain Jews believe in a certain way. And herein lies a problem. And you're going to hear rumors that start other things. So thousands. And they are all zealous of the law. Again, James is emphasizing, look, they all believe, but these are law keepers. They're strongly all into the law. And the Jerusalem church was more or less in the same category. You recall Peter had to be reminded by Paul, hey, hey you went to Gentiles. Now the separate circumcised Jews come down or believers and you're acting funny. So, yeah, these, the Jerusalem church were more centered in Jews because they get the, the uh, go-ahead Jews first. Right? You remember that? So they're definitely Jewish-centric with respect to who they minister to. So he, he's been reminded that there's thousands of Jews, based upon your testimony and what we see, who believe, but they're all zealous of the law. Now, Paul... They are informed, and they are informed of thee, that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. The term forsake Moses meaning the teachings of Moses, the Mosaic law. They're saying Paul. Now, church, Paul is by conviction a Pharisee. Right? And a Pharisee is the top keepers of the law. Nevertheless, the rumor is this guy is dissing the law and he's destroying the law. And so you're going to be in trouble among the majority of Jews, whether they believe in Jesus or not. That's what James is hinting here. Right? So they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake the Moses, saying that they are not to circumcise their children. Now, mind you, nowhere in the Paul's writings have that occurred. But when people are ready to talk about you, you hear half truth and other stories make up and combine with it so you don't know what is true. Some things will be taken out of context. So you did say something correctly, but it's not within the context as being described or, uh, or ascribed to you. So he said, yeah, look, Kids should not be circumcised, neither walk after the, the customs that Moses put down. And all of these rumors were spreading of Paul's teaching. You're going to upset the majority of Jewish people, Christians and no Christians. So James said, that's the word on the street about you, Paul. We glorify God for the ministry. However, there are some ignorant folks around who are setting to have many troubles of course, did the Apostle Paul know trouble await him in Jerusalem? He's not having it yet, but he's expecting it. We should expect when God says something is coming to pass. Just make your mind up to go through it or over it or under it, but it's going to happen because God already said. What is it, therefore, James is saying, look, the multitude must needs come together, and they will. They will know you're here. They will know that you're here. So the church now comes up with they thought was a solution. And Paul, always known to respect leadership, is a Pharisee. James is the top guy, and the elders of bodies are there. So he's going to try to do whatever they tell him to do. 
And verse 23 is going to give, tell us what he asked of, of Paul. Because James and the rest of the leaders are assuming, based upon their understanding of people's anger, if a false rumor is being spread about you and it could be proven to be false, maybe we'll quash things. Maybe we'll quash things. And it's interesting the church leaders believe the same thing. However, let's see tonight's lesson if, in fact, that would be the case. So James and the rest of the apostles said, Look, Paul, do therefore this that we say to thee. Follow our instruction. It was intended that problem doesn't arise. But what did the Spirit said? Bonds await you. So even though we try to come up with some solution to some difficulty that we have, when God's word, you know, gone out, even with good intention from the head of the church, can't stop it. Can't stop it. Because if you stop it, then God's word is not true. Let all men be liars, including the leaders of the church, but let God be true. That's where, that's show you where his word is taught. Do therefore this that we say to thee, we have four men which have vow on themselves. These are Jewish vows. Them take, purify yourself with them, uh, purify yourself with them, and be at charge with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things, whereof well, they were informed concerning thee, are nothing. In other words, Paul, show the public that the rumors that they hear that you're against Mosaic law is in, fall, in fact false, but you yourself demonstrating you're keeping the law by going with these folks who are on a vow, you yourself go into that motion, purify yourself, come out smelling like a Jew, looking like a Jew, who keep the law. That should quash things. James and the rest of elders thought that would be the case. And in fact, it sounded like a great plan. This clearly was not hatched by the Holy Spirit because it would have it worked. This was... People trying to get things the way they thought it would work. So again, wherefore they were informed concerning the what well, are nothing. James said, look, ah oh, yeah, when you do this, people think, oh, it's nothing, it's a lie. People go to jail for lies. People tell lies in them, and it come in as evidence, accepted as fact, and they're in jail. But that thou thyself also walk orderly and keep us the law. Because you're, you're keeping a, a vow law. You're, you're keeping that. So they will say, oh, he's a keeper of the law. However, let's see what happened in verse 26. 25, uh, 25 actually. Now, as touching the Gentiles, which believe, so James is letting Paul know, as a Jew, we want you to act this way to appease people's wrath. However, we send out an edict in advance of today when the Gentiles first believe. Remember in Antioch? Right. So James is letting Paul know, even though Paul, of course, already have this information, because they're the one who actually send where? They send for confirmation and information clarification in Jerusalem with respect to the division that was happening in Antioch. And so they sent to Jerusalem to, 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 quest, to get this question answered, what Gentiles should do, keep the law or not keep the law, etc. So James said in verse 25, Now as touching the Gentile which believe, we have written, note the term which believe. You can't be a Christian unless you believe in Jesus Christ, as being Jesus as being Christ. It's just not going to happen. Jesus is a central part of a worshiper's life who believe in, G in, in God. So we have written and we concluded at that time that they observe no such thing. What? Jewish laws. So the Jerusalem church, the head of the, I mean the top leadership is telling the people in the 21st century, we didn't tell you to keep no law. This, the, 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 uh, the sabbatical law is not yours to keep. Yet someone will tell you, you're not saved unless you keep the sabbatical law. Overriding what clearly was established from day one as not for, Jew, for, not for non-Jews. 
I'm not a Jewish person because I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm a Christ-like person, meaning a Christian, a believer in Jesus as Christ. So we concluded at that time that they are to observe what? No such thing. All we ask the Gentile believers to do, keep themselves from things offered to idols, because that's a, a spiritual pollution. We also ask the Gentiles them at that time, keep themselves from blood, which they ought not to eat the blood, the life is in the blood. We also ask the Gentiles at that time, keep themselves from blood that is strangling strangle animal and from spiritual corruption slash fornication because that corrupt your spirit. We, we said, just stay away from that which corrupt your spirit. Otherwise, you're free from everything else that we Jews do, that we Jews keep. That's what he's saying. Paul, in verse 26, obeyed the instruction from the church leader. You see, y'all see that? He obeyed it. He's in Jerusalem. He was bound there to go by in the spirit to go. His ministry was confirmed by the rejoice greatly in God. You saw that, right? So they didn't say, we condemn your teachings. No. They embraced, when they heard the testimony, the church accepted it as part of their ministry. However, uh, the Jewish belief system is not of the Gentile system. And so Paul was told to reaffirm his Jewishness, if you will, and do it as well we thought maybe it would work. In this instance here, they're hoping that it will quash the rumors. Paul took the men, as indicated by James, the next day purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to, to, to uh, signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. So it was in that mode of purification under the vow. So all Jews do that. Gentiles don't do that stuff, right? So Paul is indicating here, I am doing that. But when the devil wants to get you, he doesn't care where you're at. Let's look at verse 27. When and when the seven days were almost ended, meaning days of vow, of no food, no nothing, purifying yourself through prior uh, commitment, dedication in prayer and fasting, seven days almost completed, Jews which were of Asia, so not Jerusalem, they come to Jerusalem to worship and they spotted Paul because they had con con their confrontation with him in previous months. They were in now in Jerusalem. And they see, so for example, a couple of days when almost a week passed, right? No problem. Maybe the prophecy won't come to pass, some may think. God said it, it's going to happen. Just like, oh my goodness, that person is healed. They're going to live. God said it. It's a point that the man wants to die. At some point, you're going to cry. If you don't cry, they cry for you, and some of this will cry for them. What do I mean by that? You may die before them, and then they cry for you, but some will cry for them because it's appointed unto man wants to die. God said, Paul will be in big trouble when he get to Jerusalem in this area. It's going to happen. Now, the trouble is not the Gentiles starting it. Sometimes your biggest trouble won't be the sinners that you're working with. Can I remind you of that? Sometimes it's from in your family. And you said, oh, is this possible? And sometimes it's from your church family. You said, how could this be possible? A, a man said, oh, my goodness. This person ate at my table. They were my friends. David was saying it, but it was an image of the Lord to come. So verse um, 27 says, And when their seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him, that is Paul, in the temple, they stirred up all the people. Watch those people who so, so um, discord among the brethren, because the Jews are brethren. Some folks may feel justified pointing out your errors to others. You don't need to be in that position. You don't have to be doing this. They this and that. That's 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 sowing seed of discord. 
they, they stir up the, the, the Jewish folks of Jerusalem to the point where we have problem now in the synagogue. <clears throat> and they laid hands on him, on Paul. Here is a man in his fasting and prayer and devotion. They don't care what he was doing. Their intention is, was to interrupt, to destruct, and remove him from society because they didn't believe in what he was teaching and preaching. They laid hands on him, and they cry out, Men of Israel, help. A Paul supposed to be crying for help, not them. And nevertheless, they are begging people to come join their cause to stop this man. Was Paul giving trouble in Jerusalem? No. Was he interrupting anyone in Jerusalem? No. How then can we have this uproar? Because some people don't believe in your ministry. They're going to crush you in any way that they can. Because they don't have the legal power, because they don't have the political power, they would disturb society calmness, which will in, invoke the wrath of those who have the power. One of the things about government is to keep the peace at all, at all costs in some instance. That's why we have peace officers. They're called, we call them police, but they're, you know, peace officers. And then you have different levels of, you know, people keep society, police, secret police, and then ultimately military. Uh, why? Because people just want to be in peace or you want to calm it because chaos just destroy everything. However, these folks don't care. Men of Israel help. This is the man. This is a man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law. So they're spreading rumors now in here saying Paul is a deceiver. He is contrary to his teachings, contrary to, to Mosaic law, and he's telling people everywhere. It speaks to the fact that Paul's ministry was far and wide, affecting thousands of people. Because these folks are saying that's what he's doing in all the places. And further, he brought Greeks also into the temple and had polluted this holy place. No, that, say nothing more, they're kicking you out. Say nothing more, they're kicking you out. Now, Paul didn't bring no Greeks in there. The, the church father said, look, we have some men, right, who are vow the Jews. Paul had some Greek with him, but they don't go with him on the vow. But you can't tell people that when they're angry. To listen to rationale. They're not going to listen to when anything that is not. When they're angry, they're going to make a decision in a bad way. They pollute this holy place, for they, according to the narrator, they had seen before with him in the city of Trifemus and Amphistine, uh, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple, which they supposed he clearly didn't. And all the city was moved. When they said this, this temple is now polluted, all the city was moved and the people ran together and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple. I want you to see this in this lesson tonight for a number of reasons. This is a man who walks in the anointing. This is a man who speaks and God honors it. In this instant, he has to go through with what the prophetic word said. And, and so the order of God, I know I said it a couple of times before in previous um, coming before you, it does not override God's favor or what God is doing in that hour. His order stands. Paul, I'm calling to the ministry to go to the Gentiles, but you are going to what? Suffer many things because of what you start out. At. Amen? It's going to happen. Do you think Paul will have a smooth ministry? God will be a liar. So, not because you're heavily anointed, don't think you should have trouble free in the church as a leader. Heavily anointed. Your home should never come under some 
spiritual attack. Nonsense. Anybody believe in that? You're in for a what? Rude awakening. You just can't sin when that's happening to you. You've got to hold the fort. You've got to hold to your integrity in God. Angry? Get upset. You're authorized to get upset, especially when your emotions are truly disturbed. But you're not authorized to sin in that process. Amen? Not authorized to sin. The whole city was moved. And the people ran together and they took Paul, drew him out of the temple, and fought with doors were shut. Kick him out of the temple. But that was not good enough for them. And as they went about to kill him, they went about to beat him to death. No, no. Some of these folks believe in Jesus. Some of them. Not all. Some of them are non-Christians, but they're all what? They're all Jews. And they're backing Mosaic law to the teeth. They were killed for it. Amen? They were, they were killed for it. So, they, they, so James was trying to avert this from happening, but the Jews were stirred up by haters from Asia who come to Jerusalem to worship spot Paul and decide to make a ruckus about it and upset the weaker vessel and bring them to a level of chaos in the city. Drew Paul out of this temple. And how interesting it is, just as Stephen was driven out, drug it, but God spared Paul, but not Stephen. I am telling you, don't tell me God has to do what you want him to do. There's too much biblical evidence for me to, to know that God does not operate like a cookie-cutter situation. Not every situation will come out the same way, regardless of how anointed you are. It's the ultimate purpose of God is always take precedent over any needs of a human being. He's God. And rightfully so, should do whatever he so chooses, even if it hurt me like crazy. Even if it hurt you like crazy. He is God Almighty. Job said, look, hey, he give it. I love it when he give it. But he take it. He breaks my heart when he take it. But I can't argue with him. He's God. Should a man argue with his creator? No, make no sense. Man's arm is too short to box with a God he can't even see. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Can't even see. Tidings came unto the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in a what? An uproar. Jerusalem is in chaos. And so the policing of Jerusalem, ultimately politically speaking, was that of the Roman power. Though the temple of their own guards, the Jewish people I'm referring to, the city peace was in the hands of the Roman soldiers. They heard that Jerusalem is, and they don't want that news to get to Rome. Because Rome know how um, things happen that could topple empire. It starts through disturbance. And you want to quash any disturbance. Not knowing what the nature of it is, they dispatch some soldiers immediately uh, to see what's going on. Who immediately took soldiers and centur uh, centurions, over 100 soldiers, and they ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left what? They left beating off Paul. They were beating Paul to a pulp. They were beating him to kill him. No anointing was saving him then. No speaking in tongues could have delivered him then. God could have. But church, um, here is what we call suffering for the ministry and not because you have a headache that night. Not because we can't pay the mortgage. That's nonsense. I mean, when, when I look at stuff like that, that's nonsense. Anybody in the world could say, if you can't pay the mortgage, that's pretty bad. Anybody in the world could say, you know, if you're losing sleep for whatever reason, or if you're sick, because the, the business world is expecting that. 
But when you're preaching the gospel, amen, showing people the way of life, and you, you almost getting beaten to a pulp just because you're a preacher, man, you're living for God, and you're not sinning. Brothers and sisters, what we say in the book of Acts, they said that's the time to celebrate. You cannot do that in flesh. You cannot do that in flesh. If this was about having the greatest church in Windsor, this is about having the greatest status in, the, in North America, the largest congregation, I mean, make, let God remove his hand. And you name some of the big preachers on television. And let that somebody find him in the back alley and beat him to a pulp. Let's see what would happen. I don't want that to happen, but I'm just, I'm just trying to show you here. Or break to their home and, and, and desecrate their homes and their, their family, destroy it. Uh, let's, see, let's see what happened. What I'm trying to say is if you are going to, look, these men hazard their lives for preaching this thing, for preaching the gospel. We can't play with it as leaders. We cannot then come and go around and no, no, these men willing to, in fact, Paul said before he went to Jerusalem, I'm willing to die for this. Y'all remember that. I'm willing to die for it. Y'all are crying and saying, you know, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem, please. Paul said, come on. Y'all are breaking my heart here. But I'm, I'm willing to die for this thing. It's okay to die in your sleep. Everybody will love that. Who, who don't love, who, who don't mind leaving the earth, just don't, we don't pay but when they're beating you to a pulp and God is not cushioning the blow because they were beating this man to death. His kerchief heal people. His words deliver people. His, his praying bring back those who were unconscious. Church, God didn't deliver him from getting those blows until he gets some blows. Because he's anointed, God didn't say, you can't touch my anointing. So don't beat him. No. no, he was beaten to a pulp. And saved by who? Gentiles. Beaten by who? His own brothers. I don't mean by his blood brothers. I'm talking about Jewish brothers. Beat, uh, he was beaten by them. Sometimes your opposition won't come from people who don't know you. And when, you, when, you're being go, when you're going through, please not stop judging people that say they're sinning. That's why they're going through this stuff. Please read your scripture. That's not true always. So stop judging because unless somebody tell you X, Y, Z with their mouth, you don't know. You don't know. This man wasn't sinning. Why that's happening? It's for the glory of God. They took him. Beat him to a pulp almost. And when the soldiers went there and realized Paul was uh, being beaten, they rushed him and the people stopped beating him. Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. Now, why would they bound the victim? In those days, there's a philosophical understanding is if you didn't do something, you wouldn't be in this situation. Like what we call it now in today's terminology, blaming the victim. And we still do that today in many, many instances, blaming victims for what they're not responsible for. Particularly the ladies who are being, um, um, their, their, their internal mechanism of strength is shattered by overcoming by brute force beast-like men who, uh, uh, we use the term today, sexually assault but the more brutal term is rape, uh, et cetera, um, they have to overcome tremendous hurt to sit in a court to testify against the brute, or the beast, rather, and now they're trashing her. Say she might have asked for it. Even some lame-brained judges say she shouldn't dress that way. Or, uh, literally, in society, that's actually happened for real. All those things she has to overcome 
as a victim. And yet some of them have the strength to do it. Amen? In this instance, it's the same principle. He wouldn't be under such attack if he didn't do something wrong. Let's bound him. Not let's rescue him and bring him to the office to find what's going on. And arrest those people we just pull off him. He, something must happen. Why? The cities are so upset against this guy. Let's arrest him. And it's not always true. Not always true. What verse now? So the, the chief captain came near, took him, commanded him to be bound with uh, two chains, two chains, and demand who he was and what he had done. Let's arrest him, chain him, tie him up. What have you done? Why are you in this mess? Why are you in this mess? And some cried one thing, the other cried the other. Multitude, when they could not uh, really ascertain what's going on, uh, he commanded them to be carried into the castle. Because everybody's saying this, is that. So you, you cannot really get the, the, the truth of what's going on. So what you do in a situation that you isolate. You isolate. So in this case, they're bringing Paul away from the situation and, and uh, trying to investigate after to find out what's going on. Uh, and so that's what they're trying to do in this instance. Yeah, but Paul, in nevertheless, is arrested. Because to them, he caused the public disturbance. Now, in reality, it's the visiting Jews from Asia who caused that. They call for people to help them. Right? Men of Israel, brethren, come, please help me. Here is a, here is a crook. Here is a, here is a, here is a, a man. And, and so they cause it. Paul was praying and fasting. But in this instance, he's arrested. Drag him, they lift him up, bring him out of there. Let's look at what verse 34 said here. And some care, cried one thing, others another. Right? Because, of course, it could not know why exactly. So they brought him to the castle. And as we continue, it says, And when he came upon the stairs, so that they go up into the castle, so it was that he was bore of the soldiers for the violence of Paul could not even walk up the stairs. He was beaten to a pulp by people who were so angry who believed in God. Some of them today are not a name for God. They will blow you up and say God is great. And they will tell you, God, I mean, it's just amazing how these things happen. We're going to do a lot of things in the name of God violently when God didn't ask us in, the, in this New Testament era to do anything of that nature. Old Testament era, we could clearly see from the fathers that God instructed them in that way. But we saw in New Testament, they were, we were not so instructed. That's a fact. Amen? That's a fact. Jesus never instruct violence. Uh, the teaching of the church is never to um, uh, participate in violence of any means. Uh, literally, it's not there. So it's very clear that um, these folks were still in their Old Testament mentality when they're trying to um, stamp out evil from among them. That's what they're trying to do, regardless if you're a Pharisee or not. Because that's what Paul was. He was a Pharisee, but a believer in Jesus Christ, which I would like to point out tonight, not all Pharisees was dead set against it. He was, but he, this Pharisee become one of the chief apostles in preaching God's word. This Pharisee believed so much, he willing to give his life for Christ. So don't write somebody off because you're on the other side right now. Amen. Don't write anyone out because you're on the opposite side of you. God may have in their future to join you on your side. Here is a classic example. So when they reached to the castle stairs, Paul couldn't take the stairs. He was too weak, bleeding. And the soldiers had to carry him up the stairs for the multitude of the people Followed after 
crying away with him. Oh, is that not a familiar cry? Away with him, which backs up the reality is they were, in fact, crying away with Christ. And it's usually a misunderstanding of fools who do not understand truth. These were Abraham's children. They were not Gentiles. Jews are Abraham's children. And they are saying away with the promise of God. Because they did not recognize it was the promise of God in fulfillment. Here Paul uh, healed folks, preached the word of Christ. Many got baptized, laid his hand, people received the Holy Ghost. In this instance here, he was not spared from being beaten. But if no violence ever occur in his ministry, how would you square what Christ said to him? How would you square that? You can't. Amen? You just couldn't do it. How could you not do it? Well, Christ said you're going to suffer many things. He did say, don't worry, you won't be killed by in, in, you know, them, all that. So even though they're beating him to death, here is Christ coming, sending Gentiles to rescue him. More than one occasion, Paul get beaten, almost died, but come through again. More than one occasion, sometimes they stone him. For the multitude of the people followed after crying, what? Away with him, away with him. And as Paul was led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, may I speak unto thee? Who said, canst thou speak Greek? So Paul, in his Greek tongue, speak Greek to the captain. May I speak with you? So he used Greek, and that's why he, 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 um, he asked him, you could speak Greek? Which now give him a little more favor in their eyes. Right? May I speak with you? Are thou not that Egyptian? So now we, we, we're, we're seeing some highlight here why they were quick to arrest the man. They were under an assumption of who he was. Some people write you off based upon what they thought you were, who you were, what they heard about you. Never mind what God is doing in your life. It doesn't matter. You could speak, I thought you were the, that, that, that Egyptian there which before these days made us an uproar and lead us out the wilderness, 4,000 men that were murderers. Aren't you that one? I mean, how, how could he even draw that conclusion having never even examined the man yet? Sure, they were not very smart. They just muscles for the, for the Roman so, um, government. But Paul said, I am a man which I'm a Jew of Tarshish. So I'm not, I'm not an Egyptian. I'm not, a, I'm not a leader of murderers. So that's biblical evidence, Paul removing himself from that assumption. I'm not an Egyptian. I wasn't born there. And I'm certainly not the leader of some radical band, um, group of um, thugs. I am a, a man, a Jew from Tarshish, the city of Silica, which of course is a, uh, a prominent um, state city, a citizen of no means. Now, I beseech you, I beg you, suffer me to speak. You know, help, please give me the opportunity to speak unto the people. And that was all in Greek. And when he had given him license, okay, you may speak to the people, Paul switched from Greek to Hebrew. The man was not a simple man. Not a simple man. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs in pain, bleeding, was trying to make his case. A leader don't run when there's trouble. And not we see in scripture. Run, go hide. Fire in the church, they, they probably be crowd fire, folks take up, the leader first gone. Don't care about the sheep. In this instant, Paul stood on the stairs and 
he waved his hand, beckoned his hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, after the, because they were still shouting and yelling, away with him, away with him, away with him, trying to calm them down, trying to calm them down, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, we don't know what he's saying because we're finishing here tonight. But the bottom line is Paul speaking Greek to the soldiers and knowing his audience, knowing his audience. I mean, the fact that they accuse him of being um, uh, supporting the Greeks, he just switched and addressed them in their tongue, in his tongue, in his mother tongue. In, uh, this man was definitely sent by God to do what he did. Because here's some people just trying to kill you, and all they want to do is to teach you Christ's word and convert you to Christ. A, child, a true leader must always have love and compassion in their heart, even when people just tell a lot of lies in you. Don't write them off. Pray for them. Amen? Prove them wrong by your love for them. Not just leaders. All of us should be able to, in that category... Prove someone wrong by still loving them even when they think you don't love them. Even when they say you don't love them, let the opportunity that comes demonstrate that they're wrong. Please give me the opportunity to address the crowd. After the soldiers gave him it, Paul raised his hand, get them to be quiet now, and then he spoke in Hebrew unto these men. This is Example of church leaders of the book of Acts. We cannot say we have an excuse when we get so upset, write people off, curse them out, and tell them that they're going straight to hell. How about if we tell them, Jesus loves you, and I actually do too, and mean it. And even though you won't convert them, you got to speak the truth. you got to show love. And that's all we're saying tonight. The church of God in Christ has been demonstrated in the book of Acts to be a strong, powerful leadership throughout the ministry of these early men of God. And they were not immune from disaster. They were not immune from trouble. They were not immune from the things that we're going through today. But one thing they have that I could say I love, they have the power to do many things to which we pray for today. But they all are subject to the same suffering that the word declare. The way of the cross is suffering. You've got to take up your own burden, uh, cross, and follow God bless you all tonight to at least take heed to what you hear and certainly don't be judges of that which you have no knowledge because it's evident that because a person is heavily anointed, meaning you know God is with that person. When difficulties come into their lives or they're met with unreasonable uh, challenges, do not be quick to judge, to say they have erred from God, so God is punishing them. Saying stuff like that speaks to your ignorance. I think it's important for you to pray for someone, especially when you have no idea what's going on. And when you really know what's going on, it's really time to even pray more. Amen? God bless you. We look forward to seeing you this coming Sunday here at Bet Rafa. If you're within the region of Essex County and a little bit beyond, we encourage you to come to 1670 Winder Street East, the corner of Windermere. We are expecting a great move of God this coming Sunday among us. Please come out in time uh, for, our mid, for our day s service. We start at 1030, but our uh, Christian education start at 915. We encourage you to come on out um, to our both services. So God bless you. Look forward to seeing you this coming Sunday in Jesus' name.